So today I want to go back to a Sunday school message, something, a story that we all, all have heard about, the walls of Jericho falling down. But don't tune me out. I promise I have some really deep truths I want to bring you through this, this message, okay? This is something that I studied, and I really feel like the chapter of Joshua, God just really exploded in me, and he really showed me some real revelations. And this is a message that I preached at our, um, our church back in Orlando, and it was one that, to this day, I still hear a lot of people come back, and they replay the messages, and every time it just hits home to somebody in, in a certain situation, and I really pray that God has that same word for you today. So my, my text, my main text is coming out of Joshua chapter 6. But before I go into Joshua chapter 6, where it goes into the walls falling down, I just want to frame this in some context, okay? So we all know the story of Joshua, where they go into is, um, the promised land, and they take battle after battle after battle. And they start to take kingdom after kingdom after kingdom. And you see the favor of God in, in that powerful presence, right? A lot of times I wish I could see God move in that same way, where every single day, every step, they, when they got into the promised land, God said, every step you take, even if it's in the wrong direction, you will still be victorious. That was his promise to Joshua. He said, every step you take, you will be victorious. Why don't we feel that way today? As a believer, why does it always feel like I'm taking a step in the wrong direction? I'm taking a step away from God, away from my purpose, away from where God has been calling me to do. Why does it always feel like a struggle? It always feels like a battle. And if I had seen God move in the way that he had moved in this way in Joshua, wouldn't you think that everyone for their entire life would just be amazed at what God had done? Wouldn't you think that whole entire generation that came up through the promised land would be like, wow, this is, this is God. This is what we left Egypt for. This is the reason, because God is so powerful, and he made us prosperous in this place. But I tell you something, in one generation, we fast forward all the way to the end of Joshua, okay? We go into Joshua chapter 24. In one generation, several of the tribes had turned away from God and started worshiping other gods, the gods of this new promised land. They completely forgot. In one generation, they forgot how God had moved. They forgot how God had parted the Jordan for them to get through into promised land on dry land. They forgot all the battles that they had won because of God's goodness in one generation. And Joshua, at the end of his life, had to call back all the tribes. And he had to come back to them and say, and I'll read it for you in Joshua chapter 24, verse 13. He said, then, he, this is him talking to the elders. He said, then you crossed the Jordan. This is in chapter 24, verse 11. Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens, citizens of Jericho fought against you. He's reminding them of the battle of Jericho, this Sunday school message that we all know. He had to remind the elders. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did also the Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hittites, Jer Jergashats, Hivites and Jebusites, but I gave them into your hand. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you, also the two Amorite kings. You did not do it with your own sword and bow. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil. I gave you cities you did not build. And you live in them and you eat in them and from the vineyards and the olive groves that you did not plant. In one generation, God had to remind them of all of what he had done. My title today is called Blessings Found at Battlegrounds. 
Come on, just somebody just soak that in. Blessings found at battlegrounds. Now, you might be seeing the struggles today, but there's going to be a time when God reminds you of all the blessings he had stored up in those battles. All right? Every single battle that you fought was a way for God to bring blessings into your lives. Just like these people of Israel, every single battle, they only saw the fight. They only saw the sword. They only saw the struggle. But God is reminding them here. I gave you land. You did not toil. I gave you cities you did not build. All because of the battles you went through. Oh, there's blessings in your battles, church. I don't know what you're struggling with today. I don't know what battle you came in today with. It might not be a physical battle that you're fighting somebody with, but the Bible also says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against, thank you, and powers, right? Somebody came in here with the battle they're facing against principles and powers. Anybody? Just give me a hand. Oh, we're here to fight some battles today, okay? I want to tell you, church, we came in here to fight some battles. Blessings found at battlegrounds. Let's go back to Joshua chapter 6 and and read through this a little bit, okay? So Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred. Now this is their first fight they're coming into, okay? So... You would think God brought me all this way out of Egypt into the wilderness, prepped me. We've been, we've been waiting for this war. We've been waiting for this battle, okay? We're ready. We haven't fought anything yet. We're ready to go. Our army is strong. We're ready to fight somebody. You go to a, your first battle, and there's nobody home. <laughs> you see empty, empty air empty um, fields, you see a gate that is closed, and you see walls that are tall with nobody to fight. Now, the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out. No one came in. I wonder who in this church is, is facing a situation where you feel the gates are just securely barred, like you've been prepping for this fight. You've been praying. You've been praying and praying and praying. You've been fasting. You've been getting on your knees. You've been coming to church. You've been doing everything to prep for the battle. You've been doing everything the word says to get into a position where you can see a victory, but you're facing closed doors. All you see is closed doors. You pray for an opening. You pray for a miracle. But God just shows you a closed door. God just keeps closing door after closing doors. It might be a job offer that you've been interviewing for. And you keep interviewing and interviewing and praying about it. And and you've been applying to job after job after job. And all you see is, we're sorry to tell you this. We're sorry to inform you. We're sorry, we're sorry, we're sorry. And you keep praying and you keep fasting and you keep believing and you keep preparing, but you see closed door after closed door after closed door. But God, this is the place where you brought me to. This is the position that you called me to. This is what you put me in. This is what you prepared me for. This is what you promised me. Why do you, I keep seeing closed gate after closed gate, and not just closed, but securely barred? Why would God bring me into that situation? Why would he bring me into this place of hopelessness? Verse 2, then the Lord said to Joshua, and I love this scripture verse, if you really dive into the to the meaning behind and the feeling behind Joshua at this point. Because you could could tell 
Joshua at this point probably felt so discouraged, right? I want you to feel that. Now see how God flips the script. Then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I delivered Jericho to you. See, I deliver. How does, how does this make sense? God, I am seeing closed gates, tall walls with no one to fight, and an army twiddling their thumbs. And God says, see, I delivered Jericho to you. And I can almost hear God's inflection in that, po- in that verse. See? Like, almost like he's teasing Joshua. See, I delivered Jericho into your hands, among, along with its king and its fighting men. At this point, I would have think God has got me positioned in a position to lose, right? God, what do you mean? What do you mean that I'm in this place to fight with no one to fight? It's almost like Christmas morning, right? Christmas morning, you come down, the kids come down the stairs, they're ready for a gift. And the parents have put what they have desired in a pretty box and wrapped it up tight. And it's only until they unwrap that gift until they see the blessings inside. I want to tell you that's the exact way God is looking at your situation right now. You might be seeing a tight package. You might be seeing a securely guarded gate, a barred gate. You might be seeing something impenetrable, something that cannot be done with prayer. I don't know if you came in here with cancer this morning, something that you've been praying against, something that you've been fighting the devil about. But you might have come into that situation with an expectation of seeing a blessing and a miracle. But all you saw was a tied up package and a securely barred gate. But God sees it in a completely different perspective. He's not looking at the outside. He's looking at the, what he is giving you on the inside. Amen? Your bar- Your gates and the tall walls you see are just God delivering it into your hands. Look at it from his perspective today, church. So the Bible says in, let's go, verse 3 to 5. I'm going to read this now. God says, march around the city once with all armed men. Do this for six days. Have servant have seven priests carry trumpets of ram, ram's horns in front of the ark. And on the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpet, on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up. Everyone straight inside. So God gives the order after he shows Joshua what he has done for him. One trip each day for six days, walking in circles, quietly. That's what God has brought them to do. Walk in circles for six days, one time each day, quietly. All right, not making a sound, just march around the city, walking in circles, walking in circles. At this point, could you imagine on the sixth day what these army were thinking about Joshua? (laughs) We've been prepping for this day for 40 years. We've been building this army for 40 years in the wilderness. We've been doing this for 40 years. You have us come here and walk in circles quietly, just walking in circles. Now, what had they also been doing for 40 years? In the wild, walking in circles in the wilderness, right? Isn't it kind of ironic how God would direct them to do the same thing that they've been doing for 40 years? And he would use that same thing to bring the walls of Jericho down? 
Oh, I don't know if you feel like you've just been walking in circles, coming to church Sunday after Sunday, praying about the same thing, giving the same tithes Sunday after Sunday, having the same faith, doing the same thing, going to work Monday through Friday, making the prayer, coming to church on Sunday, going and doing it again, walking the same thing with the same prayer. Every single time around, you see no change. You see no change. Day one, nothing. Day two, nothing. The same closed gates, the same tall walls, the same emptiness. Week after week after week, month after month after month, year after year after year, running in circles, seeing no change. But I'm here to tell you, God can use your circles to bring down walls. God can use your circles in a way that nobody else can. He can use your mundane activities to do something great, like bring down walls of Jericho. God can do your circles to bring down walls of within your spiritual life. He can break chains with your circles. He can break bondage with your circles he can bring healing with your circles god can do anything you will believe it with your circles he will take your everyday life the same stuff you've been doing every single day day after day after day if you do it in him in the right place at the right time and under his direction you will see power in your everyday life i promise you that I promise you that I started, when I started this uh, series within Joshua, I started taking post-it notes. And what I did, my wife is smiling because she thought I was crazy. I used to write my prayers on post-it notes because I wanted to see how much God actually answered my prayers. I, I, and I took each post-it note and put it up. And when God answered that prayer, I took it down. I tell you, there's not one post-it note left on my screen. Not one. God answered every single one. Not everyone was within a day. Not everyone was within a week. But God answered each and every single one. There is power in your circles. You just have to look at it from God's perspective. I only have a couple more minutes. So day seven, it was 13 total trips. And we all know the story. God brought the walls down, right? Now, I want to end with this one part. And I'm going to flip all the way to Mark, okay, New Testament. I love comparing the Old Testament to the New Testament. So I want to look again at Jericho in the New Testament, okay? And I want to tell you about how a shout makes a difference when you're in the right position, Okay? So this is Mark chapter 10, and I'm going to go from verse 46, all right? So Jesus is doing a lot of miracles, and it's at this time where he happens to be walking through Jericho many, many years later, obviously. So verse 46, then, the, then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city a blind man named Bartimaeus, which means the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout. He said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Started shouting in the street, a blind man shouting in the street. I've seen that a couple times in New York, but <laughs> in a couple days I've been here. But somebody's shouting in the street, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. There's something about a shout when you're in Jericho. There is something about a shout when you are positioned in Jericho. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more many will rebuke you and tell you to be quiet for your faith 
But I'm telling you, church, you need to elevate your volume above everything else. Give God a shout when others are telling you to shut up. You need to shout louder. You need to make sure they hear. Many rebuked him. Son of David, have mercy on me. He called again. But this time Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you, throwing his cloak aside. Now, this was a beggar's cloak. This meant that you were uh, certified by the state to be a beggar, okay? They gave this cloak for you to know that somebody is not uh, trying to dwindle you or steal your money. So you had a special coat, all right? He didn't wait for that healing to come before he threw down his cloak, all right? He already knew if Jesus called him, there was a blessing on the other side of that calling. If Jesus called out for him, he was already healed. He took off that coat and he said, I am already healed. I am already free. I don't need my miracle. Jesus called me. I am no longer a beggar. I am victorious. He threw off his cloak went and he jumped to his feet and went to Jesus. Jesus asked him, what do you want from me? Jesus said, the blind man, the blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Oh, if some people in the church would only have that prayer. I just want to see what you see, God. I want to see what you see. I want to see the package that you see it. I want to see Jericho the way that you see it, God. I don't want to see it from my own eyes, but God, in the name of Jesus, I want to see it from your eyes. Oh, if we could only see what God sees. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately, immediately. Oh, I believe, church, and I'm closing on this. If everybody could just stand up to your feet. Immediately, in the name of Jesus, he was fully restored. I don't know what you're going through today, what you came into this church with today, but in the name of Jesus, come on, church, just start lifting your voice. Just lift your requests up to the Lord in the mighty name of Jesus. We just declare your name is higher than every other naysayer out there, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. We just read your word. We understand, oh God, that when we are in Jericho, a shout will bring the promise down in the name of Jesus. A shout in the name of Jesus will release power from heaven. And in the name of Jesus, we just shout out your name. Somebody just shout out the name of Jesus. Come on, shout the name of Jesus. There is no other name by which men can be saved. In the name of Jesus, we just declare your word over this church. In the name of Jesus. Come on, just take another shout. Oh, just shout out the name of Jesus. Lord God, meet your people right where they are, oh God. In the name of Jesus, let your spirit just meet them right in their seat where they're standing, oh God. They came to this church in faith, believing for a miracle. And in the name of Jesus, release your power. Release your power, God. God, we dedicate this time to you. We dedicate this word to you, God. Let the walls fall. Let them see what you see, God. And let your power move in their lives in a way that they have never seen. Let every step that they take be victorious. Somebody give God some praise. <laughs>